I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. And I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, wondering how he could love me, a sinner condemned and unclean. I once was an outcast, a stranger on earth, an alien by choice, and a sinner by birth. But I have been adopted, and my name's written down, and I'm an heir to a mansion, a robe, and a crown. I am not a pastor. I am a Christian entertainer. And I feel the greatest thing in my life is to witness for Christ wherever I have the opportunity to do so. What church you go to? I said, oh, I'm a Christian. You are, yeah. And I worship in a Southern Baptist church. But if you're a Christian and go to some other kind of church, I can worship with you. Well, if I had one sermon, I could get up on a mountaintop and just preach to everybody as a lay preacher, I would do this. I'd say, make for sure that you are saved. I remember when I was saved. I'm the product of a broken home. I grew up at Wright Fort Liberty, Mississippi. July 1939, my Christian mama told me, said, Jerry, you and your brother Sonny stopped flying a little early today. We're going over to Old East Fork Baptist Church to a revival meeting tomorrow, and we're going to hear Brother Pardue from the First Baptist Church in Magnolia, Mississippi, going to preach. He's going to hold a revival meeting, and Coach Hot Moore, the big eight-football coach from Macomb, Mississippi, is going to be leading the singing. And we're going to go. This is fourth Sunday in July, and my old church, folks, has been having a revival meeting to start fourth Sunday in July. Sunday through Friday night since 1810. So me and my mom and my brother got ready and we walked to the old East Fork Baptist Church. We took a chicken pie and two egg custards, put them out there and put an oil cloth over them. Heard Brother Pardew preach a sermon that morning, Sunday morning, fourth Sunday in July, 1939. We had dinner at noon that day and then sermon right after dinner then we went back morning and night to friday night thursday night of that week brother pardew got up and said for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god i said Pff. he ain't talking about everybody and i and general uh macarthur and, and president roosevelt flashed into my little old 13 year old mind and you know that preacher said i'm talking about everybody even the president even general and I caught a hold to the back of that old pew. And I was 13 years old. I was toe-headed and barefooted. I knew more about plying than I did anything else. And he repeated. He said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Whew, I said, if that's so, I'm in a mess. <laughs> but then he smiled. He said, but God commended his life toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commended his love toward us. Think of that. That if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we can be saved. So while they were singing number 197, Only Trust Him, I walked down the aisle and I had that experience of grace that only comes from the saving power of God. And I have been a Christian ever since. Are you saved? Christianity works. Next, after I got saved, I'd make for sure that I could find a New Testament Bible-believing church and I'd put my membership in that church and I'd make them a good hand. I've been an active Christian for 46 years and the older I get the more I'm convinced the first place of Christian service for any Christian ought to be in a local church and I would recommend to you that after you get saved get into a Bible believing church and make for sure that you're not a nitpicker don't make no difference to me what color shirt the preacher wears Nitpicking. Woo! 
if you are in a church or, or if you get saved and get in a church and you feel like you've got to be a nitpicker, go by the church office and get you the name of somebody on a visitation card and you go see that family and open up the Bible and you witness to them and win them to the Lord. And then the Lord's Day, when they walk down the aisle and publicly profess Christ and join the church because of your witness, oh, 99 and 44, 100% of your nitpicking will be cute. You'll be so thrilled to see someone born into the kingdom of God, you won't have time to nitpick. After you get saved and get in a church and decide not to be a nitpicker, be sure and be a storehouse tither. Do not rob yourself of the blessing of giving. A lot of folks rob themselves of the blessing of giving. Do you know 15% of the members of my church give 85% of the budget? I make a motion every business meeting, them it ain't giving nothing. We post the name on the vestibule out there as you walk in the church. <laughs> hey, they're sending the kid to the graded choir. They're using the activities building for the young ones to go down there and keep them off the streets on weekends. They send them on the mission trip. They're using that electricity while they're down there worshiping, but they ain't giving nothing. And the sad part of it is they're robbing themselves of the blessing of giving. And I know a lot of y'all ain't going to believe this, but i got to share this with you. If somebody wrote a check tomorrow for the total budget of my church, it wouldn't affect my giving one penny. Ain't nobody going to rob me of the blessing I get from giving. And you know why a lot of folks ain't getting? Because they ain't giving. We got too many Christians in my church to print them names. They vote me down every time. I was doing a talk show the other day, and a lady called up and said, uh, Mr. Flower, I read your book, and it said you're a storehouse tithe. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, if I made the kind of money you make, I could tithe too. I said, lady, I tithe my income when I was a fertilizer salesman and owed everybody in Mississippi. If I'd have missed one payday, I'd have had to went to the penitentiary. <laughs> but I tithed my income as a fertilizer salesman, and God found me faithful when I had a little, so now he's trusting me with a bunch. A lot of us ain't getting no more than we got because God can't trust us with what we got now. We won't give none of it. After you get saved and get in a church and decide not to be a nitpicker and tie the income, make sure that you so go to church that you read the Word of God, that you hear your pastor preach, that you're so close to God that if tragedy hits your life, you won't act like a pagan, you'll act like a Christian. And I don't mind telling you, through my 46 years of being a Southern Baptist, I have had more heartache from people who I thought was devout Christians when a little rain fell in their life, they turned into a pagan. I love them folks that give thanks for all things. When they're down in the valley, they're giving thanks. When they're up on the mountaintop, they're giving thanks. Just give thanks. Me and Mama had a young one to sneak up on us. <laughs> hey, 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 giggle. <laughs> yeah. It was a Friday after Mother's Day. In 1970, that Katie, the one what sneaked up on me and Mama, was two weeks old. And phone rang about 11:30, and my daughter Amy coming back out of the bedroom where I was and said, "Daddy, a lady's on the phone, asking for you." I said, "Well, darling, maybe a wrong number or something." I don't know why anybody called me 11.30 at night. And I went and said, hello, and it's Mrs. Bridgeforth out in the county. And when you say Bridgeforth in our county, you're talking about very prominent farmers and good people. And Mrs. Bridgeforth said, Mr. Clower, my daughter was having a spend the night party. Several girls are here to spend the night with her, and several boys from Yazoo City come out to visit with them. Your son just got up and announced uh, that he was required to be home by 12 o'clock. 
and him and his two buddies some construction down here at the foot of this hill and they missed a turn and they rolled over and hit a tree so now the other two boys in the car mr flower they cut up and they hurt but your son I'm sorry, Mr. Clower, but we cannot wake him up. Well, I thought she was telling me my boy was dead. And I got up and I said, yes, ma'am, as soon as I can get on my britches, I'll be right on out there. She said, well, the ambulance is on its way. We call them first. Well, while driving to the scene of this wreck, looking through the windshield at the full moon, I started praying. I said, Lord, you know I've been all over this country popping off and suggesting to people that if tragedy hits their life, they don't act like a pagan, they act like a Christian. And I said, Lord, I want you to know from every fiber of my being, I believe every word I've been saying. And I want you to let me be in amongst the faithful that stand up and use this to the glory of God. And when I get out there and my boy's dead, I'm going to praise your holy name. If he's alive, I'm going to praise your holy name. You ain't never made a mistake. You ain't going to make a mistake with me, and I'm going to give thanks and keep going, and you're going to use this to your glory. I'm on your side. Now, it was hard to pray that prayer. As I'm a young one, what played football, and I never played high school football. Played basketball on a dirt court. For well, here I am, done got me a man child and three daughters, and my boy started out in the fifth grade playing football and went all the way to the Dixie Youth World Series. And now I'm driving out. Well, I meet the ambulance about a half a mile from the scene of the wreck. I run on out there and thank Ms. Bridgeford. She said, I'm sorry, but we couldn't wake him up. I followed the ambulance back into town, and that was my next-door neighbor, big old Chief Hill, standing over my boy with Dr. Chapman. And my wife was there. She'd already called Margarita Hill, my next-door neighbor, to come stay with Katie. And Dr. Chapman turned around and said, Jerry, we can't wake him up. I said, he's conscious, or he's breathing, but he's got a soft spot right in the top of his head. All we can do is watch him. If that pressure builds up, we've got to get him to Jackson. He'll have to be operated on. Next morning, the doctor said, Jerry, we can't revive him. We better rush him to Jackson, because if that pressure builds up, we'll have to have Dr. Hodges down there be able to operate. We put him in the ambulance, and they put him on that thing and rolled him out there. I started squalling, but I pray, and Lord, I'm on your side. You ain't never made a mistake. You ain't going to make a mistake with me. So we got in that ambulance and we headed to Jackson. I saw my neighbors stop in the yard and bow their head and go to praying for me and my boy. I saw a man putting gas on a car, stop the flow of the gas and stand up and bow his head when he saw us pass and pray for me and pray for my son. Them folks was waiting on us in Jackson, put him in intensive care for three days and three nights. I walk in there and look at him, built like Tarsh. Fine boy, he ain't saying nothing to his daddy. But the fourth day, Dr. Hodges walked out of there and said, get old Ray Clower out of here and feed him. He's going to be all right. Ray Clower played football the next year. He's a high school football coach now as I stand here to do this show for you. Christianity works. It's just like salt. If you put salt on your egg and then you decide you don't want to eat egg with salt on it, you got to throw the egg away and cook another one. Because <laughs> when you apply that salt, it's going to commence to working. If you apply Christianity, it works. And I recommend it to you. A lot of wonderful things have happened to me. Oh, I'm human enough. I like being selected the number one country comic in America a few times. Some of my buddies say, well, I don't like them award shows. I love them, especially when I win. <laughs> I'm human enough. I love that, and I ain't going to lie about it. But let me hasten to tell you, that ain't the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Greatest thing that ever happened to Jerry Clower, the Grand Ole Opry humorist, is when I become a Christian. The next greatest thing is to see someone else born into the kingdom of God because Christianity works. 
I am convinced there's just one place where there ain't no laughter, and that's in hell. And I've made arrangements to miss hell. So ha, ha, ha. I won't never have to be nowhere where some folks ain't laughing. You know of anybody don't believe in laughing. And they hunkered over and got a scowl on their face. And they bound and determined they ain't going to laugh at nothing. You tell them to go home and look in the mirror and see what all us other folks been laughing at all these many years. Thank you. I love you. God bless you. Yeah!